Uh, turn with us to the book of Joshua. We're going to start in the fifth chapter and the thirteenth verse. We watch <laughs> Joshua at the death of Moses become the leader. God sent them over Jordan. The priest, along with the covenant, stood in the stream. It backed up like the Red Sea. The Israelites went over. He had one man from each tribe of Israel, 12 men that took 12 stones. After they crossed over Jordan, they built an altar unto God. It wasn't hewn stones, but it was stones from the river Jordan. The reason they did that is because they, if their children asked, where did these come from? They could answer them that God led us out of Egypt and led us over or through the Jordan River and we're here. So that was a memorial of remembrance for Israel. Now, after they crossed over, Joshua had sent two spies to Jericho to spy out the city. We know about Rahab the harlot that hid them. And then they came back. And now they're making preparation to go and fight this battle. Now, it's important tonight, we're going to cover about three things. And we want to see how God is involved in victory. And when God is not involved, there's always failure. Right. So that goes to our lives. If God's in our lives, and we're walking with Him, and He's walking with us, and we're in His will, He has promised us victory. But the moment we decide that we're going to do it by ourselves or on our own or we get cold and indifferent and away from God, we'll see that the power and the blessing of God is not on us like it's not going to be on Israel. Now in the fifth chapter, 13 through 15, it is an important thing. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went unto him <coughs> and said unto him art thou for us or art thou our adversary and he said nay but am the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto the man who is here? And the captain of the Lord of hosts saith unto Joshua, Loose thy shield and wrought thy feet, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. First thing I want us to see, we're going to cover about four or five chapters tonight, but I want us to pay close attention. There are two times in the Bible that it's mentioned to pull off your shoes for your standing on holy ground. <coughs> Remember, where was the first time? Oh, Moses. Moses and the burning bush. And then when they get ready, this is the new land. This is Canaan. This is a land of milk and honey. They've just crossed over. And God, in order for them to have that new land, they've got to possess the <coughs> God gave it to them, so it's there. <clears throat> now, I found this quite thrilling. When Moses was looking at <clears throat> Jericho, he saw a man standing. A man standing. Now, we know that angels take on them humanly forms. Get all the way through the Bible. But I want us to pay close attention. Is this just an angel, or who is he? What did he say he was? Uh, he said that, who are you? Are you for us or are you against us? And he said, I am what? Commander of the Lord. Captain of the host of the Lord. Captain of the host of the Lord. All right. Now tell me somewhere else, and it's there, that it's ever said that who is the host or or the Lord is the host of who? Uh -huh. I didn't get it phrased right. I know. <clears throat> it said he was the Lord's host. Host. If you're the host, if you're the Lord's host, 
fouling, or I foul myself. <laughs> he said he was captain of the host of the Lord. Now, captain of the host of the Lord. Who does the Lord host? Starts with an A. Angel. 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 Now who is this man here? He's not an angel. This is Jesus. Because he is captain of the host of God. When you study Revelation, you'll find that he is captain of the host of God. So this is Christ in a bodily, bodily form. And he says to him, Joshua falls down to worship him. And then what does the captain say to Joshua? Pull off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. Same thing when, God, when Moses was spoken to by God out of the burning bush, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. Now, notice that God it has the plan for the victory of Jericho. Joshua did not have a plan. God has a plan for my life, and God has a plan for your life. But we still reserve the option whether or not we will follow that plan. So we see here that God told him this is what's going to happen. And Joshua was willing to follow. First of all, he said, I want you to take the ark of the covenant. And we know what that is. And I want you to take seven priests. Go see a bunch of sevens. I want you to take seven priests. I want you to take seven trumpets. And those seven priests are going to carry the ark and the seven trumpets, they're going to blow. And this is what I want you to do. For six days, I want you to march around Jericho, the seven priests carrying the, the ark of the covenant and the seven trumpets that they will blow when they go around the city. I want you to do that once a day for six days. Then the seventh day, I want you to go around that city seven times. And then the seventh time you go around, Joshua, I want you to stop when you've completed that seventh round, and I want the trumpets to blast, and then I want you to tell the people to shout. Now, shouting is very biblical. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. yeah. It's biblical. God told Joshua to do a little bit of shouting. Not only him... But he said, you have about them two million Jews, let it rip. Now, I've thought about the collapsing of the walls of Jericho. And I've thought about how in the world it could happen. I, I, I watch a lot of science things, read a lot of scientific things. And this is what one of the guys said. He said, if you take two million Jews and have them to shout at the uh, the top of their voice, it creates so many dBs, and the vibration from them would cause the way the foundations were laid then and the way that they were built, it would cause them to collapse. But said, we've got a problem with it. They would collapse outwardly and not inwardly. See, folks, it takes more faith to be an atheist than to be saved. Right. It takes more faith to not believe than it does to believe. We're not dealing with humanity and human things. We're dealing with divine things, God things. The one that made the, the heavens, the stars, the moon, the man. The one that created all things. We're dealing with <coughs> God, eternity. And that's what we need to see. So, they get ready. Six days. They make them one lap. They go back to the camp. They was over with. That's hard battling, isn't it? Next morning, get up, make them one circle around, go back to camp. I bet the people in Jericho thought, what in the world's them idiots doing out there? We can 
take them if they'll yeah, get up yeah. around close to us. Look at them. I think they're a bunch of cowards because they don't want to fight. All they want to do is march and blow their horn. Yeah, yeah. See, the Bible was God's. It wasn't Joshua and it wasn't Israel. It was God's. So yeah, the seventh yeah. day, they marched around seven times. The ram horns, the seven trumpets, they began to blow, and when they blew, then God said, all right, have them shout, and they shouted, and when they shouted, the walls fell in. And then it says that the Israelites then went into the city, and they, by sword and spear, they killed every living thing that was in there, man, woman, child, old people, <coughs> Uh, goats, whatever animals that were there, everything was slain. Everything was killed. Not a man was killed of Israel. Not a man was scratched of Israel. Not a man was wounded of Israel. God had promised that he had the battle. Right. And he gave it already to them before they ever went. Now if I or you had been there, we would say, man, I would never Doubt God if I seen this thing happen. <laughs> Just need to step in their shoes for a minute. Can you imagine how those boys felt when that wall fell and they charged? It's beyond my comprehension. I don't know. Now, there, <clears throat> Joshua told the two spies that he told to go into the city and spy it out. He says, go get that woman, Rahab, the heart. And bring her down. Everything fell except for Rahab's house on the wall. Isn't that amazing? One little part sticking out. And she had hidden behind the scarlet cord, which represents the blood of Jesus. They went and brought her mother, her father, her kin, her, everything that she had. And it says, and she lived with Israel from then on out. God will take anybody that will be obedient. God will take anybody in his loving arms and care for them and save them and cleanse them if they'll just care for them. Amen. Amen. I've looked through the Bible so hard, I don't find too many folks that are, are really good people getting saved. Most people get saved ain't worth 15 cents or the powder lid takes you. <laughs> That's the truth, but he loved them anyway, and he loves us anyway. Battle's over with, walls down. Joshua, God told Joshua, I'm placing a curse on this city. I'm placing a curse on it. That no other building will ever be built here. If anybody wants to try to build here, I'll visit upon the youngest to the eldest. I'll kill them all. We got to go there. It's down by the salt sea the Dead Sea, and it sits over on a borderline, and, you know, there's nothing there. It is nothing but just barren dust, the whole place. So I said, God, you must have known what you was talking about when you said wouldn't nothing ever be built here. When we got into Jerusalem, they have all under the city of Jerusalem, they have tunnels. Big enough for you to drive semis in, tanks in. And you know where those tunnels ran to? All the way down to Jericho. The walls and a lot of the stones, nearly all the stones that they built Jerusalem out of, this was a rock quarry underneath Jerusalem. And that's where they hewn the rocks out and brought them and built the city out. Well, we didn't get to go down that far. We just got to go to the edge of it. I don't think, you know, I don't know whether anybody's tried it. I'm sure somebody has, but I never did hear about it. So Jericho lies in ruin. <coughs> All right, the guys feel good about themselves now. They went over there. Nobody got scratched, cut, shot, beat, nothing. God told them, said, when you go in, I want you to destroy everything except the gold, the silver, and, and those precious things like that. 
And I want you to bring them and give that to the priest and put them in the treasury. Don't take anything because if you take anything, it will bring a curse and damnation upon you and upon Israel. Well, they're just, you know, everybody's going along. You've got a couple of million Jews, 600,000 men. So after that battle, they got to feeling good about themselves. And so uh, Ai was over uh, a city, an enemy. And so Joshua sent spies out. And those guys came back and said, well, Joshua, it's no need of us sending all the troops over there. said, so let's just send two or 3,000. Because, you know, they're weak and we, I mean, we, it won't be anything to it. We'll just go over there and we'll lay a flogging on them. Can take care of it. Joshua said, all right. So there was 3,000 men that was assembled. And they went over to Ai and they didn't think it was a big deal. But when they got over there, something changed. Their hearts melted. They ran like scared rabbits. 36 men of Israel out of 3,000 got killed. When they came back, Joshua, the first thing he did is that he tore his clothes. He fell on the face, his face, and he threw dirt in the air. And this thing went on all day long. And Joshua told God, said, God, why? Why did you do that? He said, we had, you know, you brought us out of the out of Egyptian bondage, and you brought us over here. Now everybody's going to hear about what's happened to us, and we won't be feared by our enemies anymore. Now God said, remember the victory that I gave you? I told you not to take anything as a possession out of there. Somebody, somebody, somewhere took something out of Jericho that I told all of y'all to destroy. So God said, I want you to line the tribes up, and I want you to come by tribe, and then I want you to come down by the families. And he said, I'm going to point out to you who the culprit is. And so they did. And when Achan came by, there's the man. And this is what Joshua said to him. Don't you lie to me. Tell me the truth. Achan said, well, I took a Babylonian garment. I took gold and silver. I took these things. And said, I hid him in my tent. And Joshua said, why did you do that? He said, when I saw it, I coveted it. Covetous is a bad thing. To see what somebody else has and you want it. <coughs> we need to learn to be what God wants us to be and be satisfied with what God's given us instead of sitting there looking at what somebody else has drooling at the mouth. Now here's the problem. Joshua had God's plan to go to Jericho. God did not tell him to go to Ai. Are you all right? Yeah. <clears throat> because they had had such a great victory, they didn't even give it a second thought. They could whip anybody in the country. But there's a problem. Sin had prevailed. Sin not only caused them to get whipped at AI, it caused 36 men to die at AI, but it caused them in the eyes of the world to look like fools that they had no power. <coughs> That's what cost them their victory. So Joshua takes Achan and he brings him, his wife, his children, every sheep, every goat, everything that he's got. And Israel took them out and took stones and they killed everything that he had that belonged to him. 
Now that tells me that we have responsibility. I have a responsibility as a daddy. I have a responsibility as a husband. I have a responsibility as a Christian. I have a responsibility as a church member. I have a responsibility. Because of sin, it cost Achan his life, his family's life, and 36 other of his brother's lives. And caused Israel to be defeated. Simply because of sin. Now, if we allow it in our lives, if we allow sin to come into our lives, and we don't get rid of it, and we continue to live that particular way, it's infectious. You come to the house of God with it, and maybe before long, one of your friends, it might you might lead them astray because of sin. And then they might lead somebody else astray. But more important than that, when we have sin in our lives, we remove the blessing of God off of us. He still, we're still saved. He still loves us. But that separates us and our fellowship from God. Unconfessed sin. So we see the battle at Jericho. God gave it. The battle at Ai. God didn't go with it. So then he told them, said, all right, boys, I'm going to give you a plan. Just like I gave it at Jericho. He said, I want the first thing you to do, I want you to, for tomorrow, I'm going to give the plan tomorrow. I said, Joshua, I want you to sanctify yourselves and tell all the people of Israel to sanctify themselves. Sanctify means to set themselves apart. Get it right with God. Get paid up, prayed up. Wash your hands, wash your feet, wash your clothes. Get ready because we're going to war. This time, God said, I want you to take 30,000. That's a whole lot more than 3,000. When God does something, God means business. He don't move around with right. So he got him 30,000. <coughs> and he said, we're going to have us an ambush. This is the first place I ever seen in the Bible about an ambush. I know I used to go to the movies when I was a little kid, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, they get ambushed. And I'd come back and put my six shooters on and go down behind the woods, behind the trees on the stick horse, and I'd ambush people. That means that you're hiding, you're sneaky, you're unaware, and you're gonna you're gonna do something. So here they led off and went to Ai. God told Joshua, said, I want you to send the troops around behind the back of Ai. Now don't let them get too far, but I want them to be secluded and hid. Now Joshua, you take and you go around and encamp in front of Ai. And said, when they see you, they're going to remember how they made you run before. And when they come out against you, and they will, you take off running as hard as you can. The whole 5,000 of them. They'll all pursue you. Now there's 25,000 men that's hid out behind Ai, the city. And he said, when you see them pursuing them, then you come around, and I mean go into the city and utterly destroy everything. Pretty good plan, isn't it? Yeah. Anytime God makes a plan, it's a perfect plan. Anytime that God makes a plan, it's a plan that is already completed before it ever starts. God already knows the finish of it before we ever know how to start. <coughs> now this is what God said to him. He took off running. The 5,000 with him. The 25,000 come around. And Joshua was looking back and he seen the army that was chasing him. They heard the commotion in the city that they had just left. Now here comes the surprise. These guys wasn't running from them at all. They was running to draw them out. Then God told Joshua, Joshua, take your spear. And you hold it up and you point it. Joshua took his spear. His men said, charge! Here they go. Here are the ones in the city. They're caught in a trap. That's the best mouse trap I've ever 
word and invented. You get hit from all sides and you don't know where it's coming from. And they killed them all. Now that's God's victory. The first time they took, went to Ai, they went in their own power and they had sin. The second time they went back, they went without sin and they went with the plan and the program of God. Everybody was killed except for the king. Uh-oh. <laughs> he got a treat coming. They take him to the gates of Ai that had been utterly destroyed and they hung him on the tree. When nightfall came, that it was it was the Roman tradition and all the way through the Bible, you never leave anybody on the cross till dark or after dark. That's why they took Jesus off the cross. That is tradition followed all the way through the scriptures. Then they took him off the cross, they burned him, and they put a heap of stones on him. Now, victorious. Now, Joshua has learned his lesson. He went to Ai when God didn't tell him to go to Ai. He went to Ai when there was sin in the camp. Now, when he comes out after the victory, what's the first thing that he does? He builds a altar. altar. I love that part of it. He builds an altar. And it's out of stone that have not been hewed. It means that they had not laid a chisel to them. It was not bricks or blocks, but all, all different sized stones they made an altar. And they made a sacrifice unto God. A peace offering unto God. And after they had finished with their sacrifice, I find them, I'm going to close with this. It, this is really interesting. Do you remember when Moses went up on the mount before he got the Ten Commandments that God wrote on the stone? What did God give him? He gave him the commandments, didn't he? And Moses came and he wrote those commandments down. In the Ark of the Covenant that they carried the Ten Commandments in, it also was the commandments that he had given unto Moses. There were 16, uh, 1,614 commandments in them. In these commandments, there were some that was negative and there were some that were positive. God said, if you do thus, thus, and thus, I will bless you. If you do thus, thus, and thus, I will curse you. Now, they built an altar, made the sacrifice. Then Joshua had the Levites, the priests, to bring the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant around. He took and opened the Ark of the Covenant. And he took every commandment, every 614 commandments, and he ch wrote them, chiseled them on stone. Then after he did that, he lined them up, half on one side, half on the other side. And it says that he read every commandment, word by word, before all the Israelites, even the ones that weren't Jews that had traveled along with them, and it says when he read the word, there were some converts. Man. Why did he do that? He wanted to imprint in the people's mind that, that right was right, Wrong was wrong. God was God. We can't do anything without God. Telling them, these are the commands of God. If we're going to have, be successful in everything that we do, we have got to remember the commandments of God and do the commandments of God. Now, we're in a different situation today. We're under grace. They're under law. Law is a hard thing because no man can keep the law. They were fighting a losing battle, but God's going to give them that opportunity to fight. So I'm glad that we're in grace and not under law. All right, would you stand with us, please?